All right, everybody can see the slideshow. And we will just minimize this. Oh, hang on. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Okay. Well, welcome. So as Virginia mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, attracting birds, bees, and butterflies to your garden today. And yeah, everyone loves to see these uh, uh, these creatures coming out, especially now. It's we were just talking, Virginia and I, how it uh, seems a little warmer after the weekend now, and there's some warm air out there, so things are really going to start happening. The leaves are popping out. So yeah, um, I'll go through each one, the birds, beads, and the butterflies, talk about some plants that are interesting for each one and their habitat. And yeah, at the end, we'll have a few questions. So the big thing with uh, the birds, bees, and butterflies is you need to identify the good creatures good critters. So sometimes, uh, especially when you're looking at butterfly at their different stages, their larvae, you're thinking, oh, those are ugly things and we need to get rid of them. So you got to know what are the good guys and what aren't, aren't, the, aren't the good guys. Um, again, talk about some general rules in the garden to attract our birds, bees, and butterflies, some recommended plants, and other, there are lots of garden features that you can uh, put in to uh, encourage your your guests to come and live with you in your yard. So first off, we'll talk about bees. So here we've got a bee that's really full of pollen, as happy as a as a bee. <laughs> so bees are constantly out searching for nectar, which is the sugar and the carbohydrates and the pollen, the protein and fats. This is their food. That's what they're doing, and so they're busy all day. Uh, looking for that. The yellow on this bee here, those that's all pollen particles. And so they go around, they stick their heads in the flowers and they get covered in pollen and they take that back to their, to their hives. One of the ways to get a lot of bees is to plant a wide range of plants that produce pollen throughout the season and encourage bees to visit your yard. So you have to think about it throughout the whole season. Even at this time of the year, that's one of the challenges actually in spring is what are bees going to eat uh, early in spring before we have a lot of flowers going on? Well, last week I was out in uh, Patterson Arboretum, which if you don't know where that is, that should take a gander out there. It's a collection of trees and shrubs on the corner of uh, Preston Avenue and uh, College Drive in the southeast corner. Um, and it's a collection of over 900 different trees and shrubs. Uh, here at the university. And they're from all around the world. Some are native to here. Um, and, and right now, if you go there, there's a temporary fence there, but you can go in. There are signs showing up how to get in. Uh, we, we have a fence around it because we have deer problems. So we have to fence it off for now. Hopefully we'll get a, a permanent fence soon. But anyway, last week I was in there and the willows were blooming. And willows actually have uh, male or female um, flowers on their trees and on the on the male trees where the pollen was the bird or the bees were just going nuts on there it was full of bees and I was like wow that's you know they found their pollen source there's not much out there right now but they they found it so all the big thing is to remember they're out all year round looking for food so even here on the lower right you've got a bee going into a uh, I think that's a cantaloupe plant and so it's in there and while it's in there looking for pollen, it's going from flower to flower and it's actually helping to pollinate our flowers as well. So we get some fruit. Now, some of the newest varieties of flowers, like you look in the catalogs and some of the newer trees and shrubs, they're sterile and they don't actually have pollen on them or any female, uh, uh, any nectar either. And so that's not uh, friendly to the bees. And so um, when you're looking through catalogs, if, if a flower says um, pollenless or pollen won't be a problem, or that's, that's good for us sometimes. People want that when they have cut flowers because then you don't make a mess in your house when you bring in the flower and, and there's pollen everywhere, but it's not good for the bees. And so you have to watch if you're, real, if you're trying to attract bees some of the newer varieties of flowers that are out there aren't great. Um, stick to native plants or heirloom varieties. Those often have lots of pollen and they're bee friendly. They're not, uh, they're not sterile. 
by planting native flowers and plants and herbs, you can provide a habitat in your yard or garden that will provide a safe home for our bee population, which most of you have probably heard is dwindling. And that's due to a variety of facts. Um, the loss of habitat, uh, all the sterile trees and shrubs and flowers that we're planting. Um, pesticides are a big enemy of bees. And so here in this picture, this shows you, this is um, this uh, pink flower is called bee balm. So there are some specific flowers that are really um, attractive to bees, but there are lots of things out there. You can see in here too, these are thistle heads. As much as we hate Canada thistle and dandelions and that kind of thing, the bees love them. Um, so if you have a few dandelions in your yard this early in spring, well, just think of it as you're feeding the bees. Um, bees are attracted to color. Uh, and so they especially like blue, violet, purple, white, and yellow colors. And they like to have the they like to see the color in clumps. So preferably about four feet in diameter and they need to see the flowers. This uh, picture on the left, this is a beautiful um, uh, lavender field. Of course, lavender isn't perennial here in Saskatchewan, but if you plant some lavender uh, during the summer, you'll have bees on it. Salvia is another really nice flower. And again, they're both blue, but plant them you know, in a clump, not just one flower here and there. Put them in a clump if you're if you're trying to attract bees into the yard, and that's the same thing with butterflies as well. Bees also have different uh, tongue lengths. So here, the left, this bee has a really long tongue, and then this bee has a shorter one, and so different bee species have different tongue tongue lengths. So plant a variety of flower shapes to attract a diversity of bees, and according to our uh, entomologist here at the University of Saskatchewan. He's had grad students looking at bees. He's been here. He came up from California and he's been here about, oh, maybe five or six years. And they've just been looking at, you know, the number of different bee species, native species in Saskatchewan. And there, there's over hundreds of different native bee species in the province. So we don't even know what's all, well, we're discovering what's all out there, but there's a lot of different species, a lot of different body types. And so if you put different flowers, it will attract different types of bees. The other thing that bees need are some water. And that's uh, if you're a beekeeper, you know that uh, late in the fall, early in spring, they have to go out and provide water for their bees before there's much around. So they like a clear, a clean, shallow water source, um, something where they can land on. So for example, on the picture on the right here, you have all these stones, not very deep water, but the bees can sit on the, on the little pebbles and they can just sip the water while they're, while they're uh, sitting there. So they, they don't want deep water, just something that they can sit and, and have access to. And if you can refresh the water daily, they like to have fresh water every day. Um, bees prefer single flowers or flat flowers rather than the big uh, double flower puffy blooms. So when you think of, uh, I know there are different peonies out there and you can get the peonies that have a lot of different petals on them. Those aren't as attractive as some of the simpler peonies that just have one uh, layer of petals and then the interior. So, you know, they like flowers like this on the left that uh, are daisy-like and, um, a lot of these, this is uh, the flower in the center here. That's more of something you'd see in a salvia flower so they can get in there. But yeah, not the simpler the flower, the better for the bee. And of course, avoid pesticides in your garden. Bees are not uh, pesticide friendly. And um, there are a lot of different bugs out there or, and, and people want to, you know, control the bugs in their yard. If you're a person who, you know, you do have some kind of bug that you really need to spray or you think you need to control, then try to do it either late in the evening or very early in the morning after the bees have gone to bed or before they come out. Okay, don't spray uh, during the, the sunlight hours. Try to spray after sunset or before sunrise. 
Okay, but yeah, bees do not do well with pesticides. And there's a whole bunch of different plants here to attract bees. Um, fruit trees are great for attracting bees. You know, in spring, they're all blooming. The pear trees are out there blooming already. Um, the sour cherries will be blooming soon. Some of the other things, honeysuckles or hascap, uh, those are blooming already and the bees are in there. Things like lilacs, of course, they'll be soon. Um, Monkshood, bugleweed, hollyhocks. Bees love hollyhocks, and that's later in the season. And then there's flowering herbs. They love different types of herbs, especially well when they're blooming. So thyme, oregano, lavender. I mentioned um, mint, catnip, rosemary, borage, and then there's all kinds of other flowers like rudbeckias. They love um, foxgloves, globe thistles, native thistle, baby's breath and even vegetables, okay? We need bees in our vegetables. So things like pumpkins, cucumbers, melons, we won't get fruit if we don't have the bees pollinating those. Same thing with the tomatoes. Um, if you let your broccoli flower, if, if you don't pick your broccoli or if it's um, the side shoots go off and they start flowering, the bees love those flowers that are there. Cabbage after we uh, pick it, sometimes it'll send up shoots that flower. Um, other things, Monardas are easy to grow and they spread easily. Bees love them. I mentioned dandelions, columbines, lots of different things. So those are some of the, the plants that will attract bees. So put some of those in your yard and uh, you'll see the bees around. And here's kind of a, a, a warning from Albert Einstein. If the bee disappears from the surface of the earth, man would have no more than four years to live. So that's really how important bees are. They provide food for us. If we don't have bees out there pollinating, producing fruit, uh, different vegetables, our food supply is actually in danger. And so uh, bees are um, essential to our, our existence here on earth. Okay, so now we're moving on to butterflies. And butterflies and moth, moths belong to the Lepidoptera order of insects. And Lepidoptera, that's a Greek word, and it, it refers to scales and wings. And so if we see on this picture here on the right, the scales are the butterfly, uh, are, are the modified flattened hairs. And these flattened hairs give the butterflies their wide range of colors and patterns. So this is a, a butterfly wing really up close under a microscope. And it's kind of interesting how, uh, how the scales are the, the the flattened hairs are on it. Um, the big thing about butterflies and moths uh, are they undergo a complete metamorphosis. So they a complete change in their body structure during their life cycle and their habits. So what happens is the adult lays eggs near or on host plants for the larvae and the larvae um, hatch from the eggs and they're commonly called, called caterpillars. And they're completely different in looks from the adult. So for example, here in this picture, we've got the woolly bear caterpillar, which you may have seen out there. Well, that eventually will morph into the tiger moth or the police car moth, okay? So this is what their um, immature, their larval stage looks like. And here they are as adults. And it's important to be able to identify lots of these different uh, the larval stage, because sometimes you look at the larval stage and you're like, oh, that's so disgusting. I need to get rid of those. They're going to kill my tree. You know, these wormy things, like if you look here, this, this uh, uh, larvae um, of the Columbia silk moth, it'll feed on large birch trees, choke cherries, silver buffalo berries, willows, rose species. So you may have seen this in the wild, but if when it goes through its next stage, it turns into a beautiful Columbia silk moth. So if you kill this guy, you're never going to see this guy. And lots of times we see these things in our trees and our shrubs and whatever, and we think, oh, we got to get rid of them. It's eating some leaves. They look horrible. Um, but for the most part, most of these guys will not kill a plant. Uh, it's very rare that you would get a plant dying from uh, from the larvae. Um, they might eat a lot of the leaves and it can stress the plant out a bit, but it wouldn't kill the plant. And so if you're killing these guys, you're never going to see the adult. So you really have to be aware 
of what what lar what larvae go with what uh, butterfly or moth. So here, this just kind of goes through the life cycle of the moth or larvae. So again, you have the egg. The the adult butterfly lays eggs on the leaf or in the tree or on the bark. The first stage, you have larvae hatching out, and it goes through different uh, molting stages. So goes from smaller to larger. And again, lots of times these stages are quite ugly. You're like, ah, I don't like seeing those things. Eventually then uh, this uh, forms a pupa, which is a hard case around it. And it will sit dormant in a tree or on a plant for a certain amount of time. And then out of that, the butterfly or the moth emerges. Um, this is the, the larvae, or this is the chrysalis at this stage, if you've heard that term. Okay, um, a few butterflies and many moth species spin a silk case or cocoon prior to pupating. And others may pupate in crevices or even underground. So you'll find them everywhere. Sometimes you'll see these hanging on trees, just depends. But like I said, sometimes they'll just be in the crevice of a tree bark. Okay, so here you may have seen swallowtails or the Canadian tiger swallowtail uh, butterfly. I think it was last year. I rarely have seen, well, I don't even recall ever seeing this actually, but last year for some reason, it was really flying around uh, my mom's um, flowering apple trees in spring, like a little bit later at this time of the year. And there were tons of them around there, which was really unusual. Uh, but anyway, this, so this you'll find in spring and it will lay eggs. And then eventually you see these ugly worms, which are definitely not as nice as the butterfly. But if you kill these guys, you're not going to be able to see the swallowtail butterfly. All right, so that's what that larvae stage looks like. Um, the swallowtail, again, this is the, the chrysalis stage. Uh, the, and so you'll, you'll see this attached to um, a tree branch or something um, later in the, in the, or in the summer. Uh, with the swallowtail, the adults prefer lilacs and dandelions. The caterpillar eats aspen leaves or willow or crabapple leaves, which is, makes sense. They were by my mom's apple. Then we have uh, the skipper butterfly uh, family, Hesperidae. And these are yellow patch or peck skipper. And they get their name from the, the way they fly. They actually kind of skip in their flight. They kind of bounce around. Uh, the caterpillar is a dark reddish brown modeled with light brown uh, and has lengthwise black stripes. The adults drink nectar, especially from the legume family. So that's uh, things like carriganas, um, peas, beans, um, and they may be attracted to dung or carrion, uh, dead things. Caterpillars eat grass species. Okay, and here's an example. We've got the silver spotted skipper, and here's what the larvae form looks like. And here we have a common checkered skipper butterfly. And here, this is what the larvae looks like. And lots of us, I'm sure, have seen worms like this. Not very nice. Again, you're going to see them eating leaves, um, but they shouldn't kill the whole plant. They won't kill the whole plant. They, they just have to eat. They have to have some kind of food somewhere. So if you can tolerate a few worms, you'll have these nice little butterfly skip butterflies uh, going around. Another family of butterflies that are native to the prairies are the copper, blue, and hair street butterfly family, which is like Lysenidae. So the butterflies in this family are small. They can be blue, brown, or orange in color. And the males are more brilliantly colored than females. The caterpillars are flattened. They look a little bit like slugs. Disgusting. Uh, the caterpillars often eat flowering parts of dogwoods or cherry trees. So you might see them on your dogwood or cherry trees. So yeah, here's the, here's the, the caterpillar again. It is slug-like. Looks really gross, if you ask me. If I saw that, I'd be like, oh, not, not very attractive. But they turn into these beautiful, small, these are small, uh, the, the blue um, azure butterfly here, the summer azure, um, small butterflies, but they fly around quite attractive. Here's another one, the gray hair streak butterfly, which is part of that same family. 
Um, this is one of the most widely dispersed butterflies in North America because it has a diverse palate, eats a lot of different things. On the prairies, it likes legumes and mallows. So again, legumes, anything in the legume family. And then we move on to the brushfoot butterfly family, Nymphalidae. Uh, hopefully most of you have seen this beautiful morning cloak butterfly. Okay, this one eats tree sap, sometimes rotting fruit, and occasionally flower and nectar. And this, the, the morning cloak butterfly, it actually overwinters as an adult in a suitable protected crevice, such as a tree bark, uh, in a hollow, or even the eave of a house. So if you have some old tree bark, uh, an old stump sitting around, it could be um, hanging out in there. So if you want some of these around your, your house, you know, uh, provide the, hat, the habitat for the adult to overwinter and you might see them come spring. Now the morning cloak butterfly is quite beautiful, but here we've got, <laughs> this is the larvae form, which is, all, which is called the spiny elm caterpillar. And again, it looks disgusting if you ask me. And if you see these things, you'll be like, oh, I want that out of my yard. I want that off my tree. But those are the larvae form of the morning cloak butterfly. Uh, the spiny elm caterpillar, it, it can be a minor pest, especially on willow and poplar leaves. Um, they, they can form large groups and they can eat all the leaves on an entire branch. So they can be quite destructive, but they won't kill the tree. Okay, they'll be like, uh, I always think of it kind of as those, um, oh, what are the ones that come? The forest tent caterpillars where, you know, you can get so many at once and they're really gross and disgusting. But the, and they'll defoliate a tree entirely, but they won't actually kill the tree. If the tree is healthy otherwise, they won't kill it. And they, they kind of go in waves. But yeah, the spiny elm caterpillar, if you see those guys, uh, don't kill them if you want to see some morning cloak butterflies. Part of that brushfoot family, again, the same as the morning cloak, uh, we've got the variegated fritillaria, which you may see here on the prairies. And then another one here, the Melbourne's tortoise shell. So these are all possible ones that you may find. The variegated fritillaria, this is the top of the, uh, of the butterfly. And then if you see the underneath part, so this is the same butterfly, it's very plain, very brown and black. And yeah, and this is the top of it. So very different. This provides great camouflage for if it's in a tree or on a branch, you wouldn't notice it. It's uh, predators wouldn't see it as much. Whereas when it's like this it, on the left, it's quite noticeable and quite lovely. Another uh, butterfly that we have here on the prairies, the Red Admiral. And it's again, part of the brushfoot butterfly family. And there's its lovely little larvae with its spiky little whatevers. Looks gross, but again, that's what's going to form this beautiful adult. And then we have uh, the painted lady butterflies. Okay, so these are, uh, we can find these here in Saskatchewan. And this is the larvae form. If you've ever had um, some thistles growing, you may have noticed this uh, caterpillar in amongst the thistle. It will actually eat thistle leaves and uh, can get rid of a, a thistle plant. So they're kind of beneficial for us in a way um, if our thistles are getting big enough. But um, yeah, that's what they like to do. They like to hang out on thistles and eat the leaves. And then there's the, the painted lady. And of course, now we go to the milkweed butterfly family, a new family. This is the monarch butterfly that we always hope we're going to see here. It's rarely seen on the Canadian prairies. Um, they overwinter in Mexico. And sometimes the progeny that uh, starts gets far enough north uh, as far as the Canadian prairies. So what they do, they migrate up and down uh, North America. And you can actually, there's a website you can find where you can actually see the movement of the monarch butterflies as they uh, migrate north and south. And so sometimes we get them here in Saskatchewan, especially if they get flown in on the wind. Um, not very common, but sometimes we do. And this is the, uh, the larvae form of the monarch butterfly. And it's actually, I think it's quite beautiful as well. Very interesting. 
Um, if you want to try to attract monarch butterflies, plant some milkweed in your yard and uh, dog banes. The adult butterflies lay their eggs on the milkweed plant. So the adult butterflies would be coming up, you know, in, in sometime in this time into June and they'll lay their eggs and then you might see some of these uh, guys on your plants. But again, not, not overly common. And then moving on to, we have the white or the sulfur butterfly family. So these are, you've probably seen a ton of these. These are the cabbage white butterflies, the little white butterflies that fly around and they get on your, uh, <laughs> on the, the screens on the front of your car as you're driving down the highway as well. Um, these guys eat a nectar of a wide variety of flowers. They eat the leaves, the caterpillars, eat the leaves and buds of all cruciferous plants. So like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, canola. So that's why there's tons of these in the province. You'll see a lot of these. And there is the, uh, this is the larvae form. And then here's the little chrysalis that you might see on the underside of a cabbage leaf or a broccoli leaf. And there are the eggs. So just showing the different stages of the cabbage white butterfly. So you, you want to, uh, you're like, well, but I wanna, how do I get these butterflies into my yard? What are some things that I can do to attract them other than some of the plants that I mentioned? Well, you need to not only attract and feed adult butterflies on nectar rich plants and flowers, but you need to offer them an inviting place to rest, to hibernate, to lay their eggs and provide food for their larvae and caterpillar seed. So you gotta provide everything for the whole life cycle. And so kind of like bees, butterflies are nearsighted and they're more attracted to, to a stand of a particular color. They need a little bit wider grouping of flowers. Um, adult butterflies are searching for nectar, nectar and they're particularly attracted to red, orange, yellow, purple, and pink blossoms and flat topped things, flowers and short flower uh, tubes. So something that isn't a really deep flower. The bees will go in, some of the bees will go into deeper flowers, but not the butterflies so much. So some of the nectar bearing fly, uh, plants that uh, adult butterflies like are lilacs, marigolds, ornamental thistles, uh, sunflowers, sweet peas, verbenas, and zinnias. Now, when I mention the sunflower here and the zinnias, make sure that you're getting, uh, if you're growing that, that you're getting sunflowers that have pollen on it. Um, I was looking for sunflower seeds this spring because I was like, well, with the whole uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian war thing, I wanted to grow some sunflowers in my yard this, this summer. And a lot of the sunflowers are actually pollenless. So they don't produce pollen because they, again, they're growing them for people to cut the flowers, bring them in the house, and people don't want pollen. So make sure, again, that you're looking for flowers that produce pollen and nectar. Um, the other thing is you're looking for an area of plants which flower at the same time and it that will be more appealing to butterflies than just a single plant here and there and I kind of mentioned that with the bees as well um, and try to set flowers in sunny places okay butterflies like the sun alongside some rocks or stone walls if you have they like to settle on the on the rocks or the stone walls and here's just an example of uh, a brightly colored garden that would attract butterflies. So you've got some bright colors, even this picture here, okay, just the bright colors, even though they're not flowers that will attract uh, bees and butterflies. You have some groups of the same plants. So you've got, you know, these purple petunias around the edge here. You got there some pinky red plants that will be attracted. And then same as well, some more red pink plants. And the whole place is sunny. Okay, there's a little bit of stone here where they can sit on and uh, enjoy, enjoy the sun. Okay, one thing I don't see in this whole thing is a, uh, a water source, unless it's in this pot up on top. So that's one thing that I would add to this is some kind of water source in there. Um, if you're going to attract butterflies, offer a few protected patches in the garden specifically using shrubbery, tall grasses or brush piles to protect the butterflies from the elements. And again, to give caterpillars a nice safe place to pupate. This little um, uh, arb arbor or hedge 
um, that's a great place for butterflies to hang out and have their caterpillars and their chrysalids and all that sort of thing, a nice home for them. Also a nice home for, for birds, which you will hear about in a little while. Um, like bees, butterflies like to have very shallow bird baths. They need a little bit of water. So again, put a few stones in some, in some water. Uh, that will be inviting to butterflies. They also like damp gravel or wet sand, and that provides a little mineral lick for butterflies. And that gives them some fluids and some, some minerals. So again, a little sandy area in your garden might be nice or gravelly area. And they might land in there, keep it a little bit moist. The other thing, if you've ever been to a butterfly house, Butterflies like to have um, fruit in a tray like this. So if you have, if you want to uh, <laughs> spend your money and buy some fruit for butterflies, things like oranges, uh, bananas, you can set that out and they'll be attracted to, to that. The other thing is though, that will also attract flies and wasps and things like that too. So uh, it's better to have flowers and, and uh, nectar producing flowers to get your butterflies. But some people do use uh, pieces of fruit and butterflies are attracted to that. Generally um, for butterflies, choose native plants that will support a local butterfly population. Okay, so think of you're trying to attract butterflies that are in nature. And so provide as many natural or native plants as you can. Create windbreaks. Uh, for protection, that's really important. If you're out on an acreage or somewhere where it's quite open, then um, yeah, some wind breaks uh, for, from the wind are good. Plan for continuous bloom and color. So you should have something blooming in your garden throughout the whole season. Think about that, what can be happening. Um, di diversify your landscape with vines, shrubs, trees and flowers. And that goes for bees and butterflies. And wood or brush piles encourage a place to hide and rest. And that also is for bees. And again, avoid using chemicals. Chemicals are designed to kill pests and their predators. And that includes uh, butterflies and any kind of insects. They're sus very susceptible to chemicals. So some plants to attract some butterflies, uh, the Western tiger swallowtail on a butterfly bush. There is something called a butterfly bush. Um, in other parts of Canada, it's perennial. I had it survive one time in my yard, but generally um, it's, it doesn't survive our winters, but it does definitely attract butterflies. So it's called butterfly bush and you can try to grow it as an annual here. You might be able to find it at some of the greenhouses. Um, here we have a painted lady butterfly on the purple cone flower again. So purple cone flowers, echinacea, those are good attractants for butterflies. And then the Western tiger swallowtail on a milkweed. Okay, this is a milkweed plant. So yeah, there's, uh, those are some ideas for getting butterflies into your yard. Okay, we're gonna move on to the birds. So to attract birds to your yard, again, you need to supply them with what, you, what they need. So you need to provide some shelter for them, some food, some water, and a place to nest or to live. Um, birds have different requirements for nesting sites. So it depends on the birds. There's lots of different birds out there and they each like something different. So some birds like to build their nests in evergreens uh, like pine or, or spruce trees. Other birds prefer deciduous trees. So oak, birch, apple, ash trees. And then they can make their homes like in the intersections of large branches and the crevices of the branches or in uh, some of the cavities of the tree trunks. Um, some birds like woodpeckers, they prefer very large trees or even dead standing trees for homes. So sometimes if you, you know, if you have a, a tree that uh, reached its age and you cut down the stump or you can leave part of that stump uh, alive or standing in your yard if and it can be a home for uh yeah birds that like to well like woodpeckers they'll go in there and peck on the stem and then eventually maybe in the holes that the woodpeckers uh, make some other bird will find its nest in there shrubs are really important for a lot of birds um, ones that aren't too dense or thinly branched they make good homes for for bird nests especially little birds um, things like uh 
chickadees, sparrows, um, hummingbirds need little areas. So here, here's an example. This is a robin, and it's made a nest in the in the crook of a tree. This is a flowering crab, it looks like. Okay, and just where the branches meet next to the main trunk. So robins, cedar waxwings, chipping sparrows are some of the birds that will nest in small trees. Like they'll go into dense ornamental cedars, junipers, similar trees, and like I said, here in into this flowering crab as well. Large spruce trees, um, well, they'll attract things like crows, which you don't necessarily want, and grackles, and maybe merlins, uh, but they might also attract owls, okay? So you might get a nice owl in your, in your big spruce tree. So these, the spruce, the big spruce trees are more for some of the larger birds. And then when trees become large enough, uh, woodpeckers and nuthatches may excavate nest holes. Uh, and then later the holes, they'll be used by black cap chickadees. So um, woodpeckers often go into uh, a tree, they're looking for insects. And so they'll start poking around a tree that might have some insects in it and they can make holes. If they shouldn't kill the tree. If you do have uh, woodpeckers pecking in, into your tree, it shouldn't kill the tree. Um, if it would go all the way around the tree or if it would have excessive holes, then maybe, but uh, generally just a few holes will not kill a tree. And then you can provide bird houses, um, you know, that those provide good homes for birds and not every bird house is the same. Okay, so some, some bird houses, they just have a tiny hole like this one on the right, that's more maybe for a wren. And then there's, you know, just the general sparrow houses here. This is, um, Oh, uh, purple martin house, okay, full of purple martins there. So yeah, every every uh, bird house is different and attracts certain birds. And if you ever go to some of the markets here and there, like there are people who build bird houses in and around the city, and they're experts. They'll tell you what bird house to put up and how to put it up and and what how to attract birds and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, lots of these, the bird houses, if you are putting them up and the birds do migrate out back and forth, it is recommended that you uh, clean out the bird houses at the end of the season if you can. And lots of the bird houses that you can purchase now, they actually will open up on the bottom. And so some birds want the bird houses cleaned out. Some birds want to come back to the same nest. So make sure that you're aware of uh, what type of bird. And when you do clean out bird houses, if that's what's recommended, you should always also provide a light bleach solution, maybe 10% bleach solution, just to make sure that you're uh, killing off any, um, any possible disease issues or anything. And then make sure it's dry before you set it up again and before any bird goes back in there. One of our biggest problems with uh, birds in the city are cats. They're, they can be big predators and they can take out a lot of songbirds. Um, birds need shelter from their predators. If you have a cat, put a bell around the cat's neck so that it can warn the birds that the cat is coming. All right, uh, this cat's saying, lucky for you, I went vegan today. <laughs> Okay, and shelter for the birds, not just the bird houses, but then if you're putting up uh, little uh, bird feeding stations, you know, put a little roof over it so that the seed isn't all wet. And birds don't like to sit out in the rain either. So either you can have uh, like really dense bushes that provide them uh, shelter from the rain or a little, just a little uh, stoop like this where they can sit under there when it's raining or snowing. Um, just keep them out of the elements. And like it can be man-made or natural. And here again, here's some natural uh, protection. So this little owl is in, inside of a hole in a tree trunk. Here we've got some tall grasses that are protecting, protecting this little bird. And here this is in a, uh, a Russian olive tree. We've got a bird um, hiding in there and providing protection from the wind and the rain. Okay, of course, birds need food. And food can come from a variety of different sources. 
uh, plants, fruit, seeds, insects. So here we've got uh, this guy is eating some of the leftover um, berries off of uh, one of the uh, crab apple trees. This bird needs some worms. So some people say, I don't like worms in my garden. I hate it when there's worms. Well, the birds love the worms. And so if you encourage um, worms in your garden and you're like, well, how do I do that? Well, um, make sure your soil is healthy. Add some compost, uh, avoid chemical fertilizers. Uh, um, so just things to, you know, make your soil healthy. Um, don't use pesticides. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, this, this bird here on the left, it's sitting on uh, a, a plant that has seeds on it. And so, you know, provide plants that, uh, instead of putting out bird seed, grow plants that produce seed, and maybe you'll, uh, you'll attract birds. There are lots of different bird feeders out there. Um, there's different feeders for different birds and all sorts of cool suggestions and things out there. Um, I know that there's concern now with avian flu in birds. I'm gonna mention that at the very end of the talk and as to whether we should be having bird feeders out now or not. But generally, um, yeah, there's lots of different bird feeders and there's a really good uh, bird feeding book out there. I think it's called Saskatchewan Bird Feeders or anyway, it's by Trevor Harriet. And he talks, it's, a, it's a, an easy to read book, fairly thin. And they talk about feeding birds. And I was always concerned with feeding birds. If you start feeding birds, especially in the winter, do you have to keep feeding them or, or you know, do you get them used to it? And then if you forget to fill your feeder or you go away, uh, are the birds gonna die? And according to what he wrote, it's uh, if you provide bird feed in the in the winter, it's kind of like supplementing it and the birds aren't dependent on it. So any extra feed you can provide is good. Um, and don't worry about, you know, not having your feeder full right on time. Um, they're not depending on that solely. The birds still can find food in the wild, but by having a bird feeder out, it's just helping them out in the winter. Uh, goldfinches, if you want goldfinches, you got to have some niger seed on hand. And uh, there's a specific or a feeder that they prefer over some of the other feeders. And it, again, it's uh, different plants, plant flowers that will produce seed in the summer and can be a food source in the winter. So again, the cone flowers come up. They, they were the uh, attracted butterflies as well. Sunflowers, um, daisies, zinnias, goldenrod, asters, echinacea, rudbeckia, uh, lots of native and non-native grasses. So they produce these, uh, these um, seed heads in fall. Don't cut that off in, in the fall before spring. Leave your seed heads on. Um, and then that provides food for the birds over the winter. Again, uh, here we've got some sedum and grasses. So your sedum plants, they produce uh, seeds over the, over the, in the fall. Don't, don't take off your plant heads in, in uh, fall. Leave it over winter. The birds, that's seed for the birds when they come in and they land. Same with all these grasses here. Um, here we have a high bush cranberry bush that has some cranberries left on it. Again, those birds will come in uh, and eat those throughout the winter. How many of us have um, uh, mountain ash trees with the red berries? And again, the, the birds come in early in spring, they're eating the, the mountain ash berries. And what would, what would spring be like without drunk birds and, and bird poop on our cars, right? <laughs> from, the, from the mountain ash berries. So yeah, uh, leaving berries on the trees over the winter, any kind of a fruit, fruit tree yeah, helps them out. And yeah, again, so some fruit trees, small crab apples, Saskatoon berries, high bush cranberries, hascap or blue honeysuckle. Hascap, it, if you're not familiar with that plant, that's a fairly new plant out of the University of Saskatchewan. They produce little tiny purple oblong berries early in spring. So they're already flowering and we should have hascap berries by early July. And if you're not quick, if you have hascap uh, bushes in your backyard, if you're not quick and you get don't get out there to pick them, the birds will pick them for you. So you'll 
you know, go to work in the morning, you'll see the berries on the bushes, you come home at night, and all the berries are gone. So the birds love hascap berries. So if you want to track birds to your yard, plant a hascap bush, but uh, you might not get any for yourself. <laughs> uh, pin cherries, mountain ash, choke cherries, dogwoods, hawthorns, hackberries, dwarf sour cherries, all kinds of uh, different fruit trees that we can plant for, our, for to attract birds. Here we have a nice uh, common red pole eating the, the mountain ash berries in winter. You can see he's really getting in there. And yeah, like I said, he'll be drunk on the, on the fermented berries. And water. Okay, I, I mentioned water for bees and, and for butterflies. Well, birds need water too. Uh, they need water for drinking and for bathing. So smaller, uh, smaller birds prefer only about a half inch of water. Well, large birds will deal with two inches of water. Um, top it up, change it daily. You can have little water fountains that they will enjoy. Um, again, the bird baths can be deeper uh, than for the butterflies or the bees. They just like shallow bath, shallow water, but birds will uh, appreciate even a little bit deeper, deeper water baths. Make sure though that your uh, bird bath or your pond is uh, out in the open like this so that they can see if there are any predators coming, any um, uh, uh, aggressive birds coming up behind them or a cat or something. This uh, bird bath is not as great because it's, you might think, well, they like to be in the bush, but when they're in here, they can't see, there could be like a, a predator sneaking up on them of some sort, whether it's a cat or again, a crow, a magpie on some poor little songbird. So it's better to have it right out in the open so they can see everything around them. What about hummingbirds? Okay, I love hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds need nectar rich plants and water. So some of the birds that uh, or the plants that are recommended, tubular flowers, like Nicotiana and Petunia. Again, both of these, especially the Petunias, there's a lot of new varieties of Petunias that don't actually have much nectar in them. So make sure that you're getting Petunias that actually have some food for the birds. Uh, bee balm, red columbines, delphiniums, hollyhocks, butterfly bush, cardinal vine, lantana, monarda, fuchsias, they're all, uh, Salvia plants, they all attract hummingbirds and they like to stick their beaks into those long tubular flowers. Hummingbirds prefer shelter from wind and some shade. Uh, the best way to attract hummingbirds to your yard is by hanging a hummingbird feeder next to a mass of flowers that attract hummingbirds. So, you know, hang a fuchsia plant next to your hummingbird feeders. The hummingbird feeders, um, make sure that you you don't necessarily, you don't need to add food coloring or lots of times you'll see this liquid is red in color. You don't need that. You just need um, sugar water. And there's a good recipe online on the USASC uh, gardening website, I believe, but you should double check this. I think it was a third to a half cup of white sugar to um, two, four cups to four cups of water. And again, um, do not use honey in your feeder. The hummingbirds do not, uh, uh, they don't do well with honey. It plugs up their, um, their, uh, their tongues, gets them sticky and they can't actually feed. So you just wanna use white sugar, which seems counterintuitive. You think, well, honey, honey is uh, healthier, but no, for hummingbirds, you just want the white sugar mix. So just some general tips here as we're going over this. So to attract birds, uh, so provide many different layers in your yard for birds. So everything from large trees to shrubs, to perennials, to annuals, some grasses. Uh, remember that birds live in nature and so create as natural a setting as possible. Select a range of shrubs and plants. So there's food and shelter available year round. Okay, the birds, like I say, some fruit trees with some, some fruit on in the in the winter or some seeds on the grass plants or sedum. Those are great for birds. Create a dust, this is, I haven't mentioned, create a dust bath in a sunny spot near where the birds like to feed. Sparrows, they like to spend hours playing on the dusty ground. They like that. Um, do not remove leaf litter from your perennials or your shrubs. 
Okay, leave the leaf litter in there. Don't clean off your, your perennials in fall. This material provides an excellent home for bugs and insects that birds actually feed on. And if you add mulch on your, um, uh, organic mulch on your perennial bed, so things like post peelings or bark nuggets or um, flax straw, all of that will be beneficial for birds that'll help insects. Uh, there'll be insects under there and the birds will go in and eat those insects for you. Uh, create a, a brush pile at the edge of your property, starting with your old Christmas tree and any other fallen branches if you have room for this. Creates a pile six feet in length with loosely stacked branches. Um, that's a, a, a perfect place for birds to hang out to go in and out for shelter. They might build a few nests in there, some of the smaller birds. So that's another possibility. And like all the other ones, avoid pesticides. Birds eat insects, they need insects. And uh, yeah, pesticides are not good for birds. I thought I should mention uh, about avian flu because that's been a big topic uh, this, this uh, spring. Um, so avian flu or bird flu, it's a common naturally occurring virus in birds, but it has many forms or subtypes. And generally there is some sort of avian flu in the population. Um, they believe that all birds are susceptible to infection by uh, avian flu. Some birds like waterfowl can be infected with the virus, but develop no signs of the illness. Uh, birds become inf infected via the fecal oral route, so um, eating and going on feces. This happens through direct contact with secretions or feces of infected birds, contaminated surfaces, or infected food and water supplies. It also may be possible for wild birds to transfer the virus by their feet, feathers, or dander. Um, and the potency or the virulence of avian flu varies greatly among various subtypes subtypes of the avian, avian flu virus. There are, so there are lots of different types of avian flu. It's not just one disease. So sometimes there are some very mild types. This year, um, there was an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian flu influenza, the H5N1 strain, which they noticed um, in birds across Canada and the US. And they noticed an outbreak in Alberta this was on an Alberta website in uh, April 2022. So uh, currently in mid-May, the outbreak seems to be declining. Okay, that was the report on the website. And they've uh, decided that because they've found fewer sick or dead waterfowl or raptors. Wild birds can carry the virus. However, the big fear is that the wild birds will come in contact with poultry farm birds. So that's the big fear is that they don't want uh, poultry birds to become infected with this. Like I said, in the wild, it occurs naturally and it's usually around, but um, it, you know, it's kind of like, well, birds get diseases and, and it goes through the population. So then the question is, well, should we be feeding birds or shouldn't we? Should we have bird feeders up or shouldn't we? So I, I did some research. Um, some scientists say taking down bird feeders, others say it's not necessary. Right now, there's no official recommendation unless you also have poultry, so like chickens or geese or something on your acreage or in your backyard or something like that. They recommend keeping your bird feeders clean with a mild bleach solution and make sure that you dry it after cleaning. Don't leave any bleach uh, around for the birds to land on. In British Columbia, they're noticing that, uh, or there's a little bit of fear that it might, that it was in one of the poultry um, farms in the Fraser Valley. So they, BC has taken the stand of not, they're recommending not to feed birds between April and October. No other province in Canada is recommending this. Um, so they're saying we don't have to take our bird feeders down, but at the same time, if you wanna be extra cautious, um, birds don't really need to be fed during the summertime to survive. It's just nice for us to see the birds in our yards, right? We like to see the, the finches and whatever. Um, so if you are going to feed your birds, just make sure that you keep the feeders clean, that you uh, wash them um, at least, I think it was once a week. Uh, they're recommending do not feed any wild birds by hand at this time. So if you're a person who feeds, 
birds by hand. It's a very rare uh, occurrence that avian flu would transfer to a person, but they're saying don't feed them. Uh, just to be safe, don't feed them with your hands. And yeah, clean out your bird feeders. They were suggesting about once a week to clean them out, uh, disinfect them. I guess it depends how many birds you, you see around the feeder. The other thing is, like the big concern is that you would get a whole, uh, that birds congregating together would spread the flu more to each other. So if your birds aren't, if you aren't getting a feeder where you have like five or six birds all at once at the feeder, it, there's less of a chance where if you just have one or two birds coming and going, there's less of a chance of the avian flu um, spreading to other birds. So in summary, um, just to let you know, birds, bees, and butterflies enjoy a wide variety of plants, sizes, and types. Um, educate yourself about what type of habitat, food, and shelter each creature needs, and then give those plants or those creatures supply their needs. Remember that birds, bees, and butterflies live in nature. So try to make your garden as natural as possible and as diverse as possible. Uh, provide shelter and places to live, as well as food for all different stages of creatures year round. Remember that every living thing needs water. Um, avoid pesticides. And that might mean that your garden isn't perfect, but the birds and bees and butterflies will appreciate that. And have some fun and enjoy your, your guests to your garden. So that concludes my talk. And uh, I just wanted to show this picture on the right here. I know this was in my backyard. It's not great, but I wanted to share it. That's a huge dragonfly that I saw in my yard last year. And I, I haven't identified it yet, but this was on a hollyhock that was uh, sending out seeds in the fall. It's green in color. All right, I'll stop sharing my screen and we will go to back to Virginia. There we go. Thank you, Jackie. That was a fascinating look at uh, attracting birds, bees and butterflies to your garden. And we've got time for some questions. No questions today. <laughs> um, everybody's really quiet after the long weekend. Oh, here's one. Um, any specific recommendations for balcony gardens or container gardens to attract uh, uh, birds and butterflies? Um, again, mostly because it's on the balcony, I would say uh, annuals. Um, you can get salvia, which are good ones. Uh, um, what else is out there? Some daisies, Rudbeckia is a good one uh, for the balcony gardens. Um, any kind of annual flower that that like uh, that will produce uh, seeds or nectar, and yeah, maybe if you have something that produced uh, some tiny seeds, like even the echinacea, they have tiny seeds on them. You know, if you don't mind, leave your your containers out in fall, and hopefully the birds will come and even eat those seeds in in winter. Snapdragons, that's what I was thinking of. That's a good one too, snapdragons. What, what do you think about heated bird baths in the winter time? Um, I th from what I've read, I think they're okay. Uh, a lot of times the birds that uh, need that water, they're gone anyway. So I don't think it's necessary and birds do eat snow. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think that uh, I, I'm not sure it benefits the birds as much as we might think. It might attract birds so you can see them closer, but it's not necessary to help out the birds. And I also noticed here that uh, Trevor Harriet, his book that I recommended is called Backyard Bird Feeding. That's the book that uh, I recommend. It's a really good book. And oh, that I can see. be purchased at McNally Robinson? Or? Yeah, I, that's where I got mine at McNally Robinson. Yeah. Okay. Um, I attract many birds when I water my roses with a gentle sprinkler. And I sit and watch them for hours. Cool. Sounds that's like neat. fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see another question. When should I clean out last year's leaves from under my Katoni Aster hedge? Birds are nesting inside the hedge now and they have overwintered. Um, 
Yeah, I would wait because if they're nesting now, they might be laying eggs and things like that. So the best time would be um, right before uh, winter. So I know I said, okay, so I said, yeah, don't clean up your leaves and, th and things in the perennial. But the thing with uh, Ketone asters is uh, like you don't have, hmm. Ketone asters can get fire blight. And so lots of times you want to clean up those leaves in fall to, to discourage fire blight. If you haven't had any fire blight issues on your Ketone asters, then you don't have to clean up the leaves. If you are bound and determined to clean them up, then I would clean them up in fall. Um, right before it freezes up. And I know that's going against what I said, but you also don't want your Ketone asters to be dying of disease. So the best time if you're taking out leaves from under your Ketone asters is after they drop in fall because you don't want to disturb the birds now. They're probably setting up nests and they might have eggs in there and things. Okay, do we have any more questions for Jackie? Okay, well, Thank you so much for this uh, fascinating look at uh, attracting wildlife. I certainly never knew all those things that I could be doing. Um, so thanks, uh, Jackie, and thanks everyone for attending today. And don't forget to check out all our programs on our website, scoa.ca, and watch for the survey to pop up immediately after we end the meeting. And um, so goodbye, everybody, and enjoy the beautiful weather today, and um, we'll see you later. Bye now. See everybody. Thanks.